You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Vivian Nunes. In a European Union vote last week, member states, including Britain, voted to ensure bee-killing pesticides stay on the market, even though bee numbers are in serious decline. Meanwhile, last month, British scientists called for hundreds of thousands of deer to be culled, saying numbers had spiralled out of control. Last summer, it wasn't deer but badgers that were facing the chop. Farmers want the black and white British icons killed because they carry bovine TB, a disease that causes thousands of cattle to be slaughtered each year. And it's not just country types that need to watch out. Earlier this year, London Mayor Boris Johnson called for a fox cull after a baby was allegedly bitten by a fox in the capital. Then, of course, there's the horsemeat scandal, the ash tree dieback epidemic, and plans to dissect the English countryside with HS2 and fracking for natural gas. Environmental crises are dominating the news like never before. Yet at the same time, more and more people seem disconnected from the natural world. Today we're asking, are people in Britain now totally out of touch with nature? Do we only see the environment as a resource to be exploited, rather than an ecosystem we're a part of? Joining me to discuss the current state of Britain's relationship with the environment are four environmental experts. Erin Gill is an environmental journalist and historian and the news editor of Wind Power Offshore. Alistair Harper is a senior policy advisor at Green Alliance, a London-based think tank and lobby group agitating for better environmental outcomes in Britain and overseas. Louise Kolbitsky is a lawyer and advocate for eradicating ecocide, a group working to end large-scale destruction of the environment by implementing an international law against ecocide by 2020. And joining us on the phone is Hugh Warwick. He's written widely about Britain's favourite creatures and the people who champion them, including his favourite, the humble hedgehog. To get things started then, I'd like to ask each of you, why is it we're seeing so much bad news about the environment and such frequent calls for extreme action such as culls? Are we at a crisis point or is the media hyping up the scale of the problem? Erin Gill, I'll start with you. I think that we're seeing a typically British response that's quite contradictory to environmental crises. So I think there's been a history in Britain of... uh, relying on culling uh, when it comes to animal disease. So I think we're seeing something that, you know, Britain just has often looked to culls to deal with animal disease. But I think in other ways, we're not, we're not reaching any more of a crisis than, than we were at five years ago. Um, we have a different government. And perhaps what we're seeing is more contention in public about how to move forward. I think there's There's a lot of uncertainty about whether this government is making the most innovative choices when it comes to the environmental problems that we that we're facing. And that includes things like energy, not just animal, animal health. Today, we're we're hoping to have a decision about new nuclear power in this country. So I think that we're just facing a lot of very difficult decisions and the public is not entirely on board with the government. That's why it feels like a crisis. I might go to Hugh Warwick then on the phone. Do you think that's, do you agree with that? Do you think it's no more of a crisis now than it has been in the past? I wouldn't say it's a crisis. I'd say it's an inevitable consequence of having a government which is um, beholden to, in many parts, the rural constituencies and has got a very close working relationship with the landowning class. The Conservative government has always been um, the party of the landowners and the landowners are are, are very powerful. Um, If you look to the series of problems you outlined at the beginning, um, whether it is turning to towards, you know, culling badgers or foxes or, or, or even hedgehogs up in the Outer Hebrides, which got me excited about all of this. Um, these are very much sort of reflexive, non-scientific responses to uh, crises, often looking towards identifying scapegoats for what are on the whole management issues. So, I mean, if you look at the issues of, of the badger cull, yeah, bovine tuberculosis is a disease of cattle which has spread to badgers. Um, it's not the other way around. And it's to do with poor management on the part of the farming community. The farming community doesn't want to have to cut margins any further, so they look for a scapegoat. So I would say we are currently with a government which is going to sort of very much fall into line with the landowners. And so in that sense, yes, there is some sort of crisis, but I would also agree with Erin that it is not um, a, a major difference from normal because normally it is the power 
powerful who looked to try to make these decisions. And um, they will always be those who are in power, whether they are Tories or Labour's or whoever. It will be people who have got the capacity to, to enact things which are frequently non-scientific and pretty stupid. We saw recently uh, probably the biggest agricultural scandal for a while in Britain, the horse meat issue. Do you think that came about because we are becoming too cut off from the environment in which we live and don't ask where our food comes from? The horse meat scandal was was fascinating. I mean, it was. I mean, I haven't eaten meat for nearly thirty years, um, so I felt slightly smug about the whole thing. But the, um, the 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 idea that 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 these bits and pieces of other animals are getting into the food chain, for me, was absolutely. It was brilliant at illustrating the disconnection people have got from their food resources. I, I wrote um, quite some time ago about the biggest problem about the meat industry is the fact that people don't actually buy animals to eat. They buy bits of anonymous blobs of pink wrapped up in cellophane. They're not connected with meat. And I I think anybody who wants to eat meat ought to be obliged to attend an abattoir at least once a year just to remind themselves what they're party to. Um, So from, yes, I mean, I think it's a a tragedy that horses on the other side of Europe are being chopped up and stuck into burgers. But it's a tragedy that any livestock is treated as inhumanely as the majority of livestock is throughout the European Union. Alistair Harper, what's your response to that? There's two contradictory problems we face. On the one hand, we need a science-led model to deal with the environmental problems we face, things like climate change and risk to uh, bees and our habitats. But at the same time, we need to make sure that the public values and feels a part of the environment in which they live. And that's the challenge you face with big infrastructure. It needs to be done in a way that engages those whose landscapes it is, which is everybody. Louise Kulbitsky, how do you rate the government's response to environmental problems at the moment? There is a tendency to try and address the the symptoms of an underlying cause. We're looking at addressing the symptoms of climate change, of things like deforestation, which, which are symptoms of the underlying cause, which is our relationship to nature and our constant exploitation of natural resources. And rather than looking to the drivers of climate change, we're sort of addressing things downstream. And what we're trying to do at Eradicating Ecocide is to create uh, an international legislative framework to create that threshold to say where the level of damage goes above and beyond what is uh, acceptable and and to provide that level of security for businesses so that they can go and invest in technologies which are cleaner and greener and, and, and more beneficial to the environment than currently are being used. And so I think governments around the world are doing lots of things which are very good for the environment, but it's still not to the level that we need. And so to put those policies in place, it's important to have the law in place as well. But of course, to get the laws in place, you need the support of the government. So it's sort of a double-edged sword in a way. Erin Gill, you edit the Wind Power Offshore Mm -hmm. website. How do you find the government to be dealing with wind power at the moment or other natural resources? Well, I think energy is just such a fascinating topic for the UK at the moment because... We we need uh, wind energy, and this government is wise enough to recognise that. But it has a lot of factions, I suppose, uh, factions within um, within its own uh, within the government itself, but also outside government that um, is pulling it in so many different ways. So I think what I see in this country is a really good level of of knowledge um, within certain sectors, including energy, about, about you know, uh, knowledge about environmental impacts, engineering, scientific knowledge. There's, there's a, this is a really fantastic country when it comes to the sort of skill level of the general population, actually, you know, in an odd way. And yet, I think we sometimes end up with non-scientific or, or non-technical responses and quite romantic responses by government. So what's happening right now in the wind energy sector is is bizarre. We have this government being heavily influenced by anti-wind sentiment. People are saying crazy things. They're saying things like the turbines don't work. Well, you know what? The only way that a wind developer or owner 
um, wind farm owner makes money in this country is if the turbine works. They're not given money by us, the taxpayer, to build the thing. They're not given a cent for building it. They're given money when the turbine turns. So some of these sort of fallacies that are circulating and are not being stamped on, I think they need to be stamped on because they're actually factually inaccurate. So I think the government is sort of... It's, it's, it's in a very difficult position. It's got some extremists that it's trying to, to manage. Um, and then at the same time, it's trying to make some uh, rational decisions about energy. And the stakes are extremely, extremely high. We need the energy mix to be, to be right. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Vivian Nunes. And today we're discussing whether Brits have lost touch with nature. I completely agree with what Aaron said there, because despite what some in the government and some outside are saying about wind, the fact is that it's a huge benefit for the UK and the public gets it. When you look at polls, whether it's rural uh, people being um, polled or conservative voters being polled, there is support for wind above and beyond any other energy source. And it's a huge part of the way that the UK is going. It's going to attract huge amounts of investment. 88% of the value of our infrastructure up to 2020 is low carbon. In just energy alone, two-thirds of our investment in energy over before the next election, 2015, is going on offshore wind alone. Of the amount we're spending on gas up to investment up to 2015, it comes up to just 3%. So the way we're headed is, is clear. And it seems crazy if parts of the government aren't willing to embrace this huge growth story for this country. Is the government too easily swayed by lobby groups, whether it be in the energy sector or pesticide companies? The Environment Minister Owen Paterson has said Britain should conduct its own tests before banning neonicotinoids. But the only people who don't seem to argue they cause harm to bee colonies are the insecticide companies themselves. Hugh Warwick? Well, I think one of the problems is, just to go back to what you were saying earlier, is, is the makeup of the people who are in government. I mean, a government is made up principally of, of uh, economists and humanities graduates. There are very, very few scientists on board there. And that is a real shame, because without having scientific discipline behind these things, you're going to get a bunch of numpties running the country, which is what we've got at the moment. I think one of the really crucial things is if you go back to the semantics, go back to the words, you know, economy is what's driving everything. Economy means the management of the home, oikos, the Greek for home. And actually, what we need to do before we manage these things is to understand it, which is why we need ecology. We actually need to have an understanding of what's going on. But we dive into these things, trying to manage the ecosystem, the big ecosystem, whether that is the financial ecosystem or the food ecosystem, all of these things, without actually an understanding of how it works. Yes, the government is very swayed by lobby groups, but these are only the lobby groups that have got the power that the the government wants to gain. I mean, Owen Paterson has made a number of gaffes of late. I mean, the man is an absolute fool to think that you've got a whole group of scientists out there pointing out the need to remove neonicotinoid poisons from the environment and to stand up there and say, well, actually, I'm voting with the agrochemical industry. I mean, it really does show that we we need a (laughs) branch clearing of, of some of the people running this country. Get some people into running the country who understand the things which are important, the actual ecosystems we need to support ourselves. Alistair Harper, is this government the problem? I'm sure we'd always find failure somehow appearing in our elected representatives, just as we sometimes manage to see some success. I mean, I I think this is absolutely right, that there is plenty of scientific evidence for the cause of bee decline. And it goes to the precautionary principle, which is meant to be a conservative one, that that this is something that could solve a big problem without causing very much damage. Um, We saw the same with the Badgers last year, where the government spent 11 million on getting scientific experts to decide the best way of dealing with bovine TB, and they recommended that we don't go for badger culling uh, in the way that the government is doing. Um, So we need to get that reality check on, on how the advice that we get from our friends over dinner isn't as important as the advice we get from our experts, which is why I'm hopeful for things like something really interesting happening in this country, which is the Natural Cattle Committee done by the um, academic Dieter Helm, which will take a look at how we actually value our land and how we get the best use of it, uh, trying to avoid short-term just pouring tarmac um, over our fields and actually seeing if that field itself is more valuable remaining a field. 
Louise Kulbitsky, would a law stopping ecocide have any impact on environmental issues in Britain, such as the badger cull or the unwillingness to ban certain insecticides? Potentially, potentially. The definition of ecocide is, in brief, it's the extensive damage and destruction of ecosystems. It's a little bit more complicated than that. And the aim of it is not to say, you know, this is ecocide, this isn't. It's not a closed list. We're not saying fracking is ecocide, oil extraction is ecocide. It's about fundamentally changing the way that we address it in the first place. So looking at coming from a principle of first do no harm, first recognise that currently perhaps mining, for example, might be causing ecocide at the moment, but that there's another way for it to be done. So not to say, you know, all mining has to be banned. We are realistic. And it's about creating that framework so that businesses can do things in a way that is fundamentally completely different way of doing business so that it is not causing ecocide in the first place. And in terms of how it will affect Britain, if there was this international law in place, Arguably, the use of these specific chemicals which are causing bee colony collapse, that could arguably be an ecocide. But also in the UK, I mean, we're we're one of the financial powerhouses for ecocides which are playing out across the world. For example, RBS is one of the biggest investors in the tar sands in Canada. And as well as that, a lot of UK registered companies cause ecocide around the world, the BP oil spill, for example. So it's not just about what happens on on our home turf, it's about looking at at the wider repercussions that that the UK plays in causing, in driving climate change and and, and extensive damage to the environment around the world as well. When David Cameron and other world leaders came to power a few years ago, there was a broad consensus that climate change needed to be tackled. Since then, though, we've had the global financial crisis and the issue has all but disappeared from the political agenda and public discourse. Has the recession killed green policies or have green groups let that happen? Alistair Harper from Green Alliance, I'll have to go to you. The recession has showed how important valuing our environment is, valuing our resources are. We need to use less and make it do more. That seems to be the principle behind what Ecoside is, is, is trying to do. All around the world, people are growing their low-carbon environmental economy. Um, Russia has the 11th biggest in the world. It's worth $85 billion and grew 2.6% in the last financial year. Everyone's doing this. No one's alone. And, and you know, I think it would be fair to say that Russia is regarded as a fairly fossil fuel-powered nation. In the UK, um, we've got $122 billion sized green economy. So we're headed in one very clear way. And, and the British public get this. I mean, it was about this time last year that we had towns flooded during a drought, so you couldn't use your homes pipe in your flooded garden. People know that things aren't going according to plan, and you're seeing a big change. I agree there was a delay in the political discourse after disappointment at Copenhagen, but I think reality um, has meant that people in business are just having to deliver the realities needed, and you're seeing the politics changing again with recent words from America and and the way Obama's taken on the uh, post-hurricane nation that he's been re-elected to represent. What does everyone else think about that? Do we think the government is on the right track and people themselves are moving in the right direction or have things slowed down too much? Erin Gill? I think climate change is going to come back um, onto the political and public agenda with an absolute force that it hasn't had yet. But I don't know when that's going to happen. But there's no question. I think this uh, this um, experience we've had in the last year or so of drought and and flooding um, is something that people need to start talking about in terms of climate change. We we don't know why. You know, we we can't be very precise about the impacts of climate change at a local level in the UK. And I think that some of the scientists who tried to do so had their hands slapped and possibly for good reason. But that doesn't mean we can't talk about it in some way. We have to find the words to discuss what's happening. Because when I travel by train around this country and I see the fields flooded at the moment and I hear from nature conservationists who talk about the fact that they cannot manage the land in the way that they have promised the public they will because they can't get onto the land. They can't graze animals on a particular piece of land in order to produce the beautiful habitat that then we'll walk on and say, oh, isn't this lovely? They can't do it because they can't get the the animals onto the land. That's what I'm hearing from uh, Somerset. I'm also hearing it from the northeast of England. 
So, you know, we've got some things happening that people, I think, haven't yet been able to find the vocabulary to discuss. But I think in the next five to 10 years, there's going to be an explosion of new discourse around climate change. I just wanted to add to that point. I mean, looking at what the government's really doing, listening to any fine words that David Cameron and the ministers may have said at one time, um, and then matching them up with the reality of what they're doing, uh, they don't care one jot for the climate. They don't care one jot for the future. They care only for the short-term realization of their economic goals. And as a clearer example of that, you don't need to look further than the plans they've now got with the national curriculum, actually removing references to the climate change, the idea that this is something important from primary schools and from the beginning of the secondary schools. And they're going beyond that. They're actually pushing towards changing the way that teachers are forced to teach their children about the environment to make it much more acceptable to basically uh, um, inculcate children with the idea that the sorts of changes were happening are part of what normally happens in nature. Um, so I think there is a real need to go absolutely down to the heart of this. We need an education for everybody from the top to the bottom. But what the government is doing right at the moment, looking to change the way children are taught about the natural world, um, is, is really, really clarifying what's at the heart of this government's agenda. Anything else they say, yeah, listen to those words, fine, but look at what they're actually doing and what they're doing is destructive. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Vivian Nunes and today we're discussing Britain's relationship with the environment. Joining me in the studio are environmental journalist Erin Gill, Green Alliance advisor Alistair Harper, lawyer and advocate Louise Kulbitsky, and on the phone we have Hugh Warwick, an ecologist and author. Louise Kulbitsky, we've had two quite opposite views there, that Britain is mostly on the right track investing in renewable energies and that the government doesn't care at all for the environment or environmental policies. How do you read it? I, I, I was going to mention about the, the climate change being left out of education as well. It's a huge, huge downfall on, on the government government's part. Um, and I agree, education is incredibly important for climate change and that we probably will see an explosion in the discourse in the future. And I think that at the moment, yes, the government is, you know, they are doing various things which are good. I mean, for example, we've got the Climate Change Act. We've we've committed to 80% reductions in CO2 emissions by, you know, greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. But the reality is that actually not enough is being done by any means. You know, we're not going to meet those em emissions reductions if more isn't being done. We could potentially be heavily investing in fracking, locking ourselves into a system whereby, yeah, we do have short-term emissions reductions, but it sort of draws investment away from renewable energies and also looking at more efficient measures which can address climate change. And as well, looking at the market to sort everything out, when climate change is one of the biggest, you know, the biggest market failures of this century is really not the way to go about it. I, I, I don't think the market can sort out climate change, which is why I believe that the law has a, has a really very important role to play in this. Well, I'll let Alistair come in there. You're quite optimistic about what the government is doing. I'm not necessarily optimistic about what the government's um, saying or doing. I just think that um, political uh, rhetoric can, can only avoid reality for so long. And it's pretty clear that where our investment has to go and where it is going is in low carbon power. What we have to do with our resources is value them and make them last as long as we can. I, again, though, don't think that the market um, can deliver this automatically. And that the most efficient way is clearly to regulate and to legalise which direction we want to be, because it's very hard to move away from a standard short term profit model. But that doesn't mean we're not headed in the right way because of the problems we face. I find it very hard to imagine that we won't see a renewed target for 2030 at an EU level. It will be important that the UK is in the right position to benefit from that. I think that in 2015, we're likely to achieve a UN target for emissions that will be very important for other nations like Russia and America, I think China's already moving quite fast, to all be ready to benefit from this kind of thing. It's going to happen because of the problems we face. We can only pretend the problems don't exist for so long. Erin Gill? Yes, I want to say that I don't feel enormously confident of this government, but what 
I do feel confident about is that this country is is filled with ecologists and engineers and scientists and even members of the public um, who are reasonably well informed, in some cases very well informed, about the environmental issues that we face. I think that that knowledge and that concern and experience is going to at some point have a much better bigger impact on the government policies that that we see implemented. That's what I'm confident about, not this government. We're running out of time, so to wrap up, I'd like to ask each of you to nominate just one environmental policy that you think is a priority and that the government could or should implement to affect change. Alistair Harper? On the spot, I think that uh, right now in the short term in the UK, we're passing an energy bill. Within that, there is a, an amendment from a former Conservative uh, minister and chair of the Energy Committee to commit to a 2030 target that would decarbonise our electricity supply. That would create huge certainty in the market. It's an example of where you regulate and you economically benefit as a result. I think we'd see uh, people, global companies, being willing to invest big offshore wind factories in the UK as a result of that, and, and we'd all be better off. Louise Kubitsky? Um, a tough one. I mean, I, you know, I agree uh, with Alistair, but uh, I mean, I, I think I, I would say that it's necessary to have the law in place to then ensure that the right policies get made. Um, so I would say, you know, make make ecocide a crime um, as part of a much bigger picture. Um, and, and that that would create the necessary policies that we would need. Erin Gill? I want to see this government really support renewables, including tidal and wave, which could be uh, very important for this country. And I think one way it needs to make sure that we stay on track with renewables is to challenge the factual inaccuracies, the dishonesty that is in some parts of the UK press um, becoming very prevalent. Um, You know, these dishonest columns about wind energy, because I think they will do real harm if, if they're not tackled soon. Hugh Warwick, what would be your environmental priority? Very, very different to everyone else. I hope you don't mind me going back to my favourite subject, which is the humble hedgehog, as you said. Um, What I really would like to see is proper, honest effort put into getting children in contact with nature and making sure that they get an opportunity of getting nose to nose with a hedgehog, of getting out into the wild and stop this... uh, um, um, reduction, this pulling away from uh, any proper education about what is out there and how it works. Because we're, go- we're currently making a mess. It's going to be our children who are going to be the ones who are going to be clearing up the mess. And if we are currently telling them that the only way forward is through a, um, a show business, uh, um, a vote-a-thon, um, consumerist, capitalist society, <laughs> we're all utterly and completely doomed. If we can start bringing something true, honest and nature-based back into the lives of our children. I think we have got real hope for the future. So, so my advice for everyone is get out there, get nose to nose with a hedgehog and start to remember that all this comes down to is the natural world around us. On that note, I'd like to thank each of my guests for joining me here today. In the studio, we had environmental journalist Erin Gill, Green Alliance advisor Alistair Harper, lawyer and advocate Louise Kulbitsky, And on the phone, we heard from Hugh Warwick, an ecologist and author. 